Hello everyone, and welcome to CK Med. My name is Clark, and I'm going to be taking you through CNS Microbiology. I want to make a shout out to Nikki Shaw for creating the PowerPoint, as I have adapted and added in extra details so that we can approach what you have learned in your lectures. So before we begin uh, and diving in there, I just want to say you have now reached your last module of microbiology. And I hope that you can pat yourself on the back. You have accomplished a lot. And I want to say uh, to those that are ending their term right now in term four in December, I wish you guys a Merry Christmas. And uh, if you're watching these in subsequent terms, um, I wish you a happy summer to be coming up as well. And uh, so with that, uh, I absolutely love Christmas music, but of course, I don't want to leave out those that are going into summer, so... Alright, so now let's get on to some microbiology. So to start things off, uh, it's important to understand kind of the ways that you can get infections into the central nervous systems. As we know, uh, our central nervous system is kind of a locked up, uh, hidden place from uh, our uh, immune cells, don't really like to uh, go into nerve tissue very much, uh, except for uh, the, the nervous tissue such as your glial cells and your central nervous system. Uh, however, some of our adaptive cells like lymphocytes uh, do not usually uh, hang out there for, for most of the part. They usually stay in the associated lymph nodes draining from uh, the central nervous system. So how do we get infections up to this area? Um, kind of comes down to what type of uh, infections are there, but mostly uh, they're arising through the blood route. And so if we were to describe this as far as viral infections, we have to understand that this is more of a viremia, right? That's virus in the blood. So you can get this through bites from mosquitoes, which we'll be discussing various forms uh, of infections that you get from mosquitoes that can involve your central nervous system. And then other things like transplacentally, such as uh, rubella. We know that rubella can cause a whole bunch of problems uh, that if it crosses the, the placenta, can cause a whole bunch of torch infection, uh, like symptoms and complications. And uh, of course, other things can possibly lead to um, infection of the CNS as far as nerves go, and we'll be discussing those specifically as we get there. Other things uh, as far as bacteria now, uh, so this is another type of class of organism, um, and we need to describe how they get there, and this is pretty much called bacteremia. So this is bacteria that's found in the blood, and usually this is more associated with a uh, prequal infection. And so uh, one of the most common causes of meningitis is going to be your strep pneumo, other things like uh, Neisseria. And so you have to associate in a stem, they're going to be giving you information as far as uh, what is the most likely organism that's causing this person's meningitis will kind of go off of what did they have recently. So if this person has pneumonia or sinusitis, you're thinking, what is the most common cause of pneumonia and sinusitis? Well, of course, hopefully you're thinking that that is strep pneumoniae. And that is the correct answer because um, if they were just to leave a stem as someone had pneumonia, now they have meningitis symptoms, what is it? You're gonna be diving for that strep pneumo. And that's kind of why these people, uh, usually adults, teenage even, the most common is strep pneumo. Other things like if this person had pharyngitis, and I wanna emphasize uh, this part extra for right now, uh, pharyngitis, usually you don't see strep pneumo causing pharyngitis. You're thinking of other things like, uh, um, like uh, strep pyogenes or something causing pharyngitis or EBV, um, right? Epstein-Barr virus, those things cause, cause pharyngitis or things like diphtheria or whatever. Those sorts of things can cause um, infections uh, in your pharynx. However, other things uh, that can lead and be hooked into your central nervous system infections are going to be your Neisseria meningitidis. Um, and so looking out in a stem for pharyngitis, person has meningitis symptoms, putting them together, you most likely are going to come across this in meningitis. Then if you go back to your stem and go, oh, this is an 18-year-old kid, he's making out with someone that also has meningitis, then that's most likely uh, the, the case for this. Other things uh, we'll be discussing uh, in particular for each of the organisms. Other things, you can have direct spread, so like trauma. So of course, most of our traumatic infections, uh, any boils or abscesses or anything that comes from tra trauma, um, you're thinking uh, either uh, your staph aureus 
or your Clostridium perfringens. However, Clostridium perfringens and anaerobe, it usually just degrades muscle. It doesn't really associate itself uh, to kind of get into the nervous system further so that it can cause further deep infections. Uh, so as far as its, its aspect to the CNS, it's usually not found. So be thinking of a trauma more associated with a Staph aureus. For immunocompromised AIDS patients, chemo patients, or patients that are um, for some reason taking immunosuppressants, you want to be thinking more of your kind of back, uh, your uh, fungal infections such as um, Candida or Aspergillus. You also have bacteria such as Nocardia that can cause um, CNS infections following uh, these patients. But we'll be coming uh, acro uh, across more of the specific infections. Actually, the most common is more of uh, parasitic, but uh, with our IC and AIDS patients, but uh, we'll be getting to those specifically. And then remember, this is more of a, a pathology tie-in. Uh, patients that have diabetes, especially ones like type 1 diabetes, if they don't control their diabetes, they can go into ketoacidosis, as I'm sure you've learned about chemistry and all sorts of things. And when you have ketoacidosis, ketones are very uh, good and nutritious food for a particular infection known as mucormarcosis or rhizopus infections. So these guys, what happens is uh, they kind of can colonize your nasal cavity. And if these patients that go into ketoacidosis have this within their nasal cavity, this can actually invade through the cribriform plate um, and get straight into the brain through direct access. And just uh, keep this in mind, this is your 90 degree angle um, branching hyphae, uh, hyphae, and these are aseptate, so they do not have septate. That's how you differentiate the acute angle of aspergillus. Uh, that kind of brings us back to uh, those guys, right? Uh, other things like contact with neural tissue, so this is specifically organisms that are living in neural tissue, such as HSV1 and 2 and HHV, like uh, chicken pox, right? Uh, all these things can be associated with reinfection of your CNS, um, so keep that in mind when we uh, get the, uh, to those places. Other things, uh, neural tissue, uh, uh, as far as direct, like uh, if you were to get bitten by a dog or something, you can get a rabies virus directly input into uh, neural tissue, right? You have nerves, uh, cutaneous nerves, and all sorts of stuff. If this virus was able to bind to any of those nerve tissues, um, that once that, that's bitten from a ratted dog, then that can in infect as well. We'll be discussing that further later. So to understand, uh, that's, that's our kind of understanding of how we get these infections. However, um, what do we see once this person has meningitis? So that, needs us, uh, that leaves us to kind of understand what is normal. So normal CSF is clear. Um, there's no uh, like murkiness to it or anything like that. Uh, it has a certain amount of these values found up here. So opening pressure should be uh, around 70 to uh, 180 uh, millimeters of water. Uh, our white blood cells should be zero to five cells. They can uh, put it in uh, 10 to the six uh, per deciliter, but this is just zero to five cells per high powered field. So this is something we need to be looking for. If we have a lot of these in high powered field, then that's more suggested that this person actually has an infection in their central nervous system. Uh, what type of cells kind of help differentiate the, the organisms? And then things that you're going to see like proteins. So this kind of comes back to pathology, right? You're not just having an infection that's breaking up all your cells and then those are popping and releasing proteins. Now that is a portion of, uh, of why there's increased protein. But remember, when you have an infection, uh, you have a hyperemia. You have immune cells responding to this area of inflammation and infection. And so what happens is this leads to permeability of blood vessels, and in this case, the blood-brain barrier. When this leads to increased permeability, we have a transudate, and we have a transudate and eventual exudate into this area, depending on the severity of the infection. And when you have these things flowing into this area, it brings with you plasma proteins and all this thing, and this is why in these type of infections, you have increased protein. So viral, it's usually our cell mediated. They usually come in and they kill off the cells and there's not a lot of exudate or transudate coming in. So that's why their protein is only slightly elevated. Same for fungal. Tuberculosis and bacteria, we see a lot of response. Our immune cells are really responding to these, especially bacteria and tuberculosis, that we see a very high protein content in these areas. And then remember tuberculosis is growing within our macrophages that are responding, and it's also popping those as well. But uh, we also have response from our lymphocytes, uh, which we will see, and we'll be discussing each of these in just a second. 
um, we'll also see uh, other cells kind of responding to this. Uh, and then lastly, our glucose. So uh, remember, this is your 40 to 70. So I just remember uh, proteins are below 40. And then from 40 to 70, you have your glucose range. And then 70 to 180 is where you have your pressure. So they all kind of go together. Just remember PGP. So protein, glucose, pressure, protein, glucose, pressure. So less than 40 for a protein is normal. Glucose is 40 to 70. And then from 70 to 180, we have our pressure. So just put those three together and that has a nice range. Um, that, that will help you for uh, your questions uh, to approach these properly. So as far as bacterial um, uh, infections in your CSF, so uh, we talked about uh, bacteria that uh, when you have an infection, you have exudate and transudate, so that's obvi obviously going to increase your pressure, right? You also have white blood cells that are responding, uh, and a whole bunch of them. You have these bacteria floating around in the CSF, so we're going to have a lot of response from our immune system, so it's going to be a lot of cells. And then you'll see PMN. So why? Because bacteria. Remember bacteria are extracellular pathogens, and the things that respond to extracellular pathogens are going to be your uh, neutrophils. So your neutrophils kind of invade this area and really try to clean this up. If we were to do a spinal tap and take someone's um, uh, spinal fluid out uh, during a bacterial infection, I'd be seeing more of a whitish, slightly yellow um, uh, discoloration to it. It's gonna be murky, it's no longer clear. And that's how I can tell that this person most likely has a, a bacterial infection. If I were to see protein, this also uh, adds to that color and that murkiness. So when you see a lot of protein, a lot of PMNs responding, a lot of bacteria being killed, a lot of protein degradation, all this stuff happening, uh, we see a lot of protein occurring, so it's gonna be greater than 40. Um, and that kind of all comes along with your bacterial. A glucose, remember your glucose is almost going to be uh, a lot negative. So these are negative signs, not uh, actually, uh, not, not present, but it's actually less than 40. Why? Because our bacteria are floating out there. They're eating the glucose. So it makes sense that uh, our glucose levels would be decreased from 40 to 70. And these are really low, like almost uh, 10 or less uh, compared to the regular 40 to 70. For viral infections, so virus, remember your viral uh, infections involve cellular replication, so they have to get into cells, and they replicate within the cells, and then they can pop out in between the cells and infect further ones, right? And so uh, in response to this, our right blood cells are going to be pretty much left to the ones that can respond to intracellular parasites. So that's going to be your lymphocytes. Lymphocytes don't come in the millions or thousands uh, like our PMNs. Uh, millions obviously is a little bit of emphasis, but... Um, they don't come in the thousands uh, in, in amount. They usually just have a few of them that are responding because remember, lymphocytes like your CD8 T cells are very specific to what infection they're gonna be responding to. They have very fine-tuned receptors and so they're only gonna be killing cells that have fine-tuned receptors to tell them, hey, I'm infected. And so we're not gonna have a million lymphocytes all just responding and killing a bunch of cells. We have to have it very regulated. So that's why we have very little cells that are responding. However, it is still greater than the zero to five. So you see about uh, less than 100. So five to 100 you'll see uh, for, for viral. Other things you're gonna see increased protein. Why? Because we're killing those cells. We're causing inflammation. Our lymphocytes are responding in small amounts um, to the point where a little bit of exudate or transudate might be coming into this area that leads to an increased protein. It's not severe like bacteria, but there still is an increase. And then glucose will be normal. Why? Because our bacteria or our virus is not eating any glucose. It lives inside the cell. It's eating anything uh, or using energy within the cell. It's not actually eating anything. Uh, remember, viruses are not alive. Um, and so like these guys actually uh, pretty much uh, are not uh, utilizing any of the glucose, so it stays within the normal range, so 40 to 70. For fungal, uh, the, I know he emphasized that there's a variable range for this, but you will see an increased pressure. You will see a white, white blood cells respond, and what you're going to see is your lymphocytes. So uh, remember for our uh, specific fighters for fungal cells, we have to actually have lymphocytes responding to them. Um, a lot of our uh, PMNs don't really, they don't quite have the robust uh, response to fight against a lot of our fungal antigens. Remember, uh, fungus are eukaryotes, so they can have a lot of different antigens on their surface. So we need a little bit more fine-tuned, focused, and stealth fighters uh, of your lymphocytes in order to kill these guys. But uh, we'll be discussing individual uh, infections a little bit later that might have slight arrangement in, in how that actually shows. In protein, obviously we have a response in uh, inflammation, so we're gonna see increased protein. We're gonna see that in all of them. And then glucose will be decreased because the fungus will, will eat uh, that glucose. Tuberculosis is the same thing 
as your, your fungal response, except you'll see a lot of protein. Um, and it's very similar to, um, yeah, pretty much your fungal response. And why is it lymphocyte? So this uh, kind of comes down to the pathogenesis of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis uh, is an infection um, where it's sort of a chronic infection. It's actually one, uh, it is the most common chronic cause of uh, meningitis and encephalitis. And so um, tuberculosis, actually what happens is it invades uh, our, uh, or evades our immune system, makes its way into our CSF, and then replicates in the monocytes and PMNs that respond here. Uh, to the tuberculosis, so it actually lives within the cells and uh, stays within there and hides. And so in order to get it out of there, we have to kill it. And how do we kill intracellular uh, things? And that is going to be your lymphocytes responding. That's why that is there. And then again, tuberculosis, there is some extracellular living, and so it will be eating the glucose as well. So that's kind of how we break apart our CF, uh, CSF analysis. I'm sure you've seen it in neuro when you, you went over this, in addition to uh, microbiology. So you should be pretty solid on these. Uh, know these normal values. Um, just knowing them just simply from that less than 40, 40 to 70, and then 70 to 180 will give you a nice clue uh, on uh, where you are standing when you see someone with the CSF readings, and then you can analyze it based on its white blood cell number and, and type, uh, and that might help uh, narrow down your diagnosis. Um, knowing uh, lab values for your exams actually is super helpful. I know they give uh, the normal ones, but just be able to read that value and quickly go, is that normal or abnormal? Is it low or is it high? Those sorts of things will kind of get you a little bit sharpness and get you an, a lot of extra time on your exams uh, and allow you to answer more questions, have more time to go back to uh, any questions you marked or whatnot. Um, and so that's always uh, pretty good to do, especially for PATH because uh, they'll have lots of stem, uh, long stems and stuff like that. You might run out of time. Um, so knowing normal values is, is super helpful. Uh, so this uh, information as far as the appearance, uh, it's not super high yield to know actually these colors, uh, but I want to emphasize a couple that might come up. This might be something uh, you might have never seen before. Um, so I just want to kind of emphasis or emphasize uh, certain things like uh, the green, which is like a purulent uh, CSF, so this is actually a long time bacterial CSF infection. Um, you might get that that green in addition to a uh, breakdown of bilirubin. So remember, you go from bilir um, you go from heme and you break it down to biliverdin, and biliverdin is green. And then when you break it from biliverdin into bilirubin, it's now more of a yellow uh, color. And that's why you get when you have hyperbilirubinemia, you have that uh, jaundice, uh, like yellow color, right? Uh, if you have uh, orange color, this is known as xanthochromia. So this is kind of a, a breakdown of bilirubin um, in your CSF. And so uh, this actually usually is only seen in a few things that increase uh, RBCs into the tissue. So we're going to be discussing one of the viral infections. So come back to this chart when we get to that um, slide. Um, for, for this term, this is known as xanthochromia, um, but one of the eastern equine encephalitis viruses can increase RBCs, and when those break up, it can lead to xanthochromia. In addition to, uh, if you go back to neuro, uh, and when you're reviewing for step, you might come across this as well, but um, things such as a subarachnoid hemorrhage, right, you bleed into your CSF space, that's a lot of blood in there, and eventually you're going to break up those RBCs, when you break up those RBCs, you're going to break down the heme, when you break down the heme into biliverdin and then bilirubin, you're going to have a xanthochromia, or an orange colored CSF. So this is actually something you would find uh, on a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, and uh, in addition to all the present presenting signs and everything like that, uh, such as severe headache and all those sorts of things that you, you have discussed in neuro. So that's uh, kind of important to understand that you're in microbiology class and you may be taking a microbiology exam, but you can't forget that microbiology is an intricate part of medicine. You have to hook them all together. So anything you can make connections on to neuro or to physiology or anatomy or whatever you can, anything that comes up, just stop, pause yourself and say, okay, what is the anatomy? What is the physiology? What is the pathophysiology or something? Is there a connection between those two? Try to connect and make connections by yourself in addition to testing your friends or your study partner and having them do the same with you um, so that you can be more well-rounded at understanding the connections between our systems. Um, 
and, and how they hook together, and not just assigning, oh, this is just a microbiology class or this is just neuro. Because the departments really like to teach you that way, pretend that you're only in the microbiology world and you will be only answering questions in the microbiology world, but hooking them to other things will help you not only review that old material, but at the same time, you'll be actually kind of making a, a little better engram or better memory of that piece of information for microbiology that you can answer a lot of questions just based on that, that connection you already made during your studies. So I uh, just want to emphasize definitely that continence of CF uh, is very high yield. Uh, you'll probably get two or three questions on that. So now on to our bacterial meningitis um, and, and the causes of this. Uh, this is very, very high yield compared to most of these other guys. So um, the causes of bacterial meningitis kind of depend on what is the age of the patient, what are the risk factors, what are the previous illnesses this person have, and that kind of help you narrow down your differentials. So if we have a neonate, so this is uh, from birth to two months of age, um, our most likely organisms um, are going to be your strep agalactia, which is your group B strep, your E. coli, and your listeria monocytogenes. So um, I've emphasized the guys that are really high yield and most likely what you're going to get questions on. Um, but remember that some of them uh, still that, that aren't highlighted are still important. So in neonates uh, from zero to two, these three uh, are the most common. And so uh, this really comes down to what does this patient have on analysis of their CSF? And uh, this kind of information uh, is where you kind of get your differential or your di diagnosis pretty much. So uh, you have a neonate, they're going to be difficulty feeding, they might be crying, uh, pain on movement of their neck or something like that, and they'll cry extra. Um, and those sorts of things are symptoms that you're going to see in the neonate. The neonate can't tell you, ow, my neck hurts, I have nuchal rigidity, I have photophobia, all those things, the general symptoms of meningitis. Um, and so Pretty much it comes down to what is the spinal tap and the general symptoms that let me think maybe I should do a spinal tap, right? So uh, what are the organisms? So strep agalactia, this is group B strep. Uh, this is uh, a streptococcus organism that makes chains, but as compared to your strep pyogenes, this is short chains, um, where strep pyogenes are very long chains. Um, in addition, this is a normal flora in a lot of women uh, in their vaginal canal. So this is something you're going to be associating with vaginal birth, obviously. And at that point, you also have to um, think, wait, is there any way we can prevent this? So usually what we do in the United States is uh, we do a swab and we check for straight strep agalactia before uh, a female gives birth to her baby. And so uh, what, uh, we, what we can do is help kind of give her an antibiotic to treat that, get rid of it before she actually delivers the baby to decrease the risk of uh, her neonate uh, baby to um, getting this, this infection and leading to meningitis, and it's very severe. Other things are E. coli. Obviously, as the baby is coming out of the birth canal, there's a, a hole, uh, uh, another hole about an inch uh, to the posterior uh, that houses a lot of E. coli that might come out during the birthing process uh, and actually very commonly does. Uh, often during the birthing process, a female will poop. Uh, so you poop a little poop and then you poop a little baby. Um, and so uh, remember that those you put those two together, you can very easily get an E. coli meningitis infection. Other things like Listeria monocytogenes is a gram-positive bacteria we'll be talking about in a little bit. This is something, make, please make this connection right now, that it can come back in the elderly. This is a high, high yield point. Uh, Listeria is very high yield for, for examination purposes. To know what it is, its um, uh, virulence factors, and then usually who it infects, neonates and uh, old people, so greater than 50 or 60 or 70 years old, uh, and that comes back there. So pretty much everyone else, children, uh, adolescents, and adults, your most common is actually going to be your strep pneumo uh, for all of these, actually, even more than Neisseria. Uh, and E. coli and everything like that. So please keep in mind that uh, strep pneumo, once you become in the infant age, is the most common out of all these. So uh, this is one you're going to be thinking of. However, like I said earlier, um, with Neisseria, this is something you want to be looking for. Someone had pharyngitis, now they have meningitis. Additional clues, you might see uh, petechial rashes uh, and pur pur purpuric rashes with Neisseria meningitis and we'll be discussing that a little bit later. But hooking those uh, things together will give you uh, that diagnosis. Other things, uh, Haemophilus influenza used to be a very common cause of meningitis. However, due to the vaccine, 
Um, it is not. And so if someone were to have H influenza, you want to be looking for them to be unvaccinated and get them the vaccine, vaccine that they should have had a long time ago. Uh, so that's definitely an important role as doctors to be educating our patients and our patients' parents uh, as to uh, the risk factors that holds not vaccinating their children, even though um, uh, uh, there's uh, that evidence or that a uh, lack of evidence saying that, it, that there's any problems with vaccines. Um, there has been uh, a few adverse effects as far as reactions to um, vaccines like allergies and such. But uh, that one paper that said that it led to autism has been proven uh, incorrect and falsified. Uh, and so we need to educate our patients because there's this still uh, strange hysteria out in the media saying that, oh yeah, uh, still can lead to autism. And so there's this underlying belief from parents that, oh, if I get my children vaccinated, it's gonna lead to, to autism, which uh, there's no actually evidence of that. Um, so educating our patients, uh, the importance of saving your child's life um, with a vaccine uh, is very, very important. So now that we're talking about uh, the most common cause of bacterial meningitis, uh, what is that kind? That is Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, it is gram-positive, lancet-shaped diplococci. I'm sure you've never heard the end uh, of this guy, and you never will hear the end uh, of this guy um, as far as you are studying medicine and working in a hospital. When you retire, you uh, can maybe forget about this guy. So uh, etiology, it's the most frequently observed cause of meningitis in children and adults, like we said before. Uh, the risk factors are alcoholism, splenectomy patients, or sickle cell patients, right? Why is because the spleen is important to filtering out blood. And uh, what happens is streptococcus actually gets into the blood, floats around, it has a capsule, and usually that would be picked up uh, by your spleen. You take away the spleen, it's no longer picked up, so your capsulated organisms uh, can increase uh, risk for invasion of your CNS. Other things you want to be looking for, recurrent pneumonia, otitis media, and sinusitis. Why is because strep pneumo is the most common cause of these infections, which can then lead to meningitis. Totally makes sense, right? For virulence, uh, it is encapsulated. Like I said, it's IG, it has an IgA protease, as most respiratory infections uh, do, bacterial respiratory infections. It has a pneumolysin, which is a cytotoxin. And uh, actually, this only place that was mentioned in the CNS uh, section is that it carries a very similar um, virulence as your protein A of Staph aureus. So what, it, what uh, pneumolysin actually does is it binds your FC region of your IgG, um, and uh, um, that kind of flips it upside down. So therefore, it can, can uh, evo evade uh, your immune system. In addition to it attracts PMNs and kills them, um, and that's a problem. That's why it's called pneumolysin, right? Um, and then remember that on laboratory testing, you can see, uh, or growth at least, that is optogen sensitive. And I mentioned this before in our respiratory section and our GI section and every other section that this guy has come up in, um, that bacitracin, uh, it is bacitracin resistant. So that's usually not uh, something we usually test on, uh, but it has come up on, on exams. So the rule of thumb is if it's sensitive to one optogen, right? Um, then it is resistant to the other, which is bacitracin. Where if this was optogen resistant, then it would be bacitracin sensitive. So that, just uh, flip it for those four organisms that we use to differentiate using these two uh, antimicrobials. So now uh, one of the second most common causes uh, in adults and teenagers and such are Neisseria meningitidis. Uh, this is a non-motile gram-negative kidney or bean-shaped um, organism, uh, diplococci, and uh, it's oxidase positive and uh, catalase positive. And so this is our, our little guy down here. He's cute and little pink. Aww. Uh, so etiology, so it causes meningitis in children and young adults, um, usually around six months uh, to two years. And uh, uh, this is uh, due to uh, the, the de decrease in your IgG from the mother. Um, this is why usually it, it peaks around six months. Um, risk factors, so close quarters, military, college campuses, patients that have splenectomy. Why? Because this has a capsule. Um, and uh, remember back to your immunology when you were learning uh, simply about how our immune system responds to different infections. One of the things in our blood 
This is known as complement. I'm sure you've heard about this and have studied this and you know the different aspects of complement, the three different uh, initiations of complement. And remember down at the very end, we had our C5 to 9 complex and this created that MAC complex and then injected itself and made a pore into uh, bacteria and all sorts of things and cells pretty much. Well, if this had any deficiency, any problem here, we had difficulty in removing types of infections, right? And one of the number one things that came up were Neisseria infections. So this is something that uh, you have been taught in immuno. Uh, I didn't actually know what Neisseria was, even though I did microbiology as uh, my major in undergrad. I didn't even know what Neisseria was because we didn't learn a lot of the pathogenic strains in undergrad microbiology. And so I didn't understand um, when we were taught this complement thing what this Neisseria was. I had no idea what this was. And so it didn't really mean anything to me. But if you go back to your immunology now, remind yourself, go over that complement pathway, po pathway. Pause this video and go uh, w read over your complement pathway in first aid. Just simply get a picture of where this kind of fits in, right? If we have complement deficiency, we can increase risk to Neisseria, meningitis, in addition to gonorrhea. So uh, kind of put those uh, into play as this is very high yield for, for step material, uh, especially. Uh, so keep that in mind. So virulence factors, it has that capsule like I mentioned. This guy in particular uh, ferments maltose where Neisseria gonorrhea does not. That's one of our differentiating factors between those two. Obviously, meningitis is the one that's gonna be involving uh, the meninges where our gonorrhea is less likely to actually cause a CNS infection. Uh, however, uh, both can cause pharyngitis. So if I just said someone had pharyngitis and we had a gram negative diplococci uh, that fermented maltose, then I would say meningitis. If it didn't, then I would actually say this person has gonorrhea. So keep that in mind to differentiate those two. That actually would be a pretty simple, basic question uh, to differentiate those two. Also has an IgA protease, like our respiratory infections usually do, and it has pili. So uh, the pili, this is actually uh, a cause of why someone can get reinfective uh, or reinfected with Neisseria meningitis. Um, is because it, all it does is it changes its pili and that changes its outer surface molecules. So our immune system now goes, wait, what, what is this new guy? I don't know what this is. And then uh, he changes it again. I go, oh, this is, it's like camouflage, right? So that's our pili. So that is for reinfectivity. This is not actually uh, the aspect as far as what is the severity of the disease that comes from Neisseria. However, it's just for reinfective. Why did this person get reinfected with it? Or why did they... Uh, not amount a great immune response to it is because they changed the pili. Now, this next guy, I want to emphasize this a lot, okay? If you were to highlight anything from this slide, it is name Neisseria meningitis hooked with this phrase right here. Neisseria meningitis has not LPS, not lipopolysaccharide, but LOS, lipooligosaccharide. This is the major virulence factor and major aspect of mortality and morbidity of this disease. So if you have a question that asks, it simply gets you down the diagnosis of Neisseria meningitis, right? So they have meningitis signs, we do a CSF tap, they have these certain CSF things, and we see a kidney bean shaped or gram negative diplococci, right? This should be, I have Neisseria meningitis. Now what? And it says, what is the virulence factor that leads to the major uh, morbidity and mortality of this uh, in disease, right? I would, and they are going to write pili, they are going to write IgA uh, protease, the polysaccharide caps, polysaccharide capsule. So those things will be in there as options. Do not fall for it if that question is asking about what is the major virulence as far as the disease, the severity, right? So what leads to the severity of the disease or even death from this disease? and that is lipooligosaccharide. That is very, very, very important, okay? Um, uh, super high yield for that. Symptoms, so uh, acute onset of photophobia, nuclear rigidity, like our meningitis. Uh, again, um, Neisseria meningitis, this has come up in your path, hopefully, um, that uh, in your infectious, infectious path. So this can cause DIC, um, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, which can lead to your skin patechia and ecchymosis, usually around the legs or trunk, uh, but can be pretty much all over the place. And this can actually lead to death. Why? Because it usually involves um, dual sides of your adrenal glands. And this is known as Waterhouse-Friedrichsen 
Friedrichsen syndrome. Um, and this is very important to know that you need to be giving that person glucocorticoids in addition to fluids because they're going into acute adrenal insufficiency um, and they could actually die from that. So uh, keep in mind that you need to be saving these patients. Uh, one of my dad's, uh, my dad's best friend is actually a physician and uh, he saw a patient sitting down in, in his waiting room. And uh, she was uh, being brought in from, from the hospital down to his office for, for physical examination and checkout for general checkup from, the, from her hospital room. And uh, what happened is um, he, as she was sitting there, he looked over to her again and noticed that she started getting these little rash that started showing up within a couple minutes uh, of her sitting in the, the waiting room. Started seeing uh, and then get larger and larger, almost like instant bleeding into areas on her legs. And he was like, oh, snap. So he grabbed her wheelchair and he uh, there was another patient sitting there with an IV. So he unplugged him from the IV on, on fluids, hooked up a new needle, and then uh, plugged her in for that IV, got her some fluids, ran her up to um, or ran her to the emergency uh, department. They got her antibiotics immediately, got her some glucocorticoids and saved that girl's life. She would have died within four or five minutes. Um, you can actually die within a 15 minute span of time. Uh, so this is, this is very, very important. Uh, that when you see this, you need to be treating e me d e lit li. I don't know if that actually is an actual word. Immediately, <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> wow, that's pretty sad. Okay, diagnosis. So pretty much, uh, you can grow this. Uh, you have to grow it on a special auger. Uh, this is known as modified Thayer Martin auger. Uh, it's chocolate auger, pretty uh, pretty much plus uh, antibiotics. And why is because this guy's fastidia. Pretty much, he's a picky eater. He's a little sassy, a Neisseria meningitis, and so we actually have to give him special Thayer Martin auger, which is chocolate auger plus antibiotics. Um, so keep that in mind. You have to put it into a chamber with CO2, um, and, and that helps as, as well. So treatment, cephalosporin plus vancomycin. Uh, this is one of the most important things that we give for, for this guy. Uh, this is the thing you will be using uh, in your clinical rotations and as a doctor in the emergency department or wherever you work, if someone has meningitis, be giving them uh, these antibiotics. Prevention, uh, we have actually a, a vaccination. It's a conjugate vaccination. And so uh, keep in mind that, again, educate your patients on the reasons why we should be giving uh, your children um, vaccinations. Next is Haemophilus influenza. This is a non-motile gram-negative rod or a coccobacillus. Um, and this is uh, this guy up here, as you can see him, these cute little pink guys up here. Uh, Cacobacillus, and they have that nice little capsule around them. And this is uh, a polyribosyl ribitol phosphate, or PRP capsule. I couldn't emphasize that any more uh, than I did in our respiratory section, but that is the, the virulence for this guy. Um, so we'll keep in mind that guy. And it all is only expressed, this capsule is only expressed in the virulent B strains. So this is Haemophilus influenza B strain. And that's why in the vaccine, I give only a vaccine to the B type, which is Hiburix, right? So H I B Rix. Um, that's why, that's why uh, we have to keep that in mind. So if you see a question that someone comes in with meningitis and they have a cacobacillus, it's gram negative, they're non motile, this person is unvaccinated, what is the, the virulence? You're going to be talking about that PRP, right? If I were to change up that question a little bit and ask you, how does this differ? from the other forms or strains of uh, the same organism, right? So what about uh, strain A or C or D or E, right? All these other strains, right? Um, that can lead to sinusitis and the same. All of these can lead to that. What, what is the difference between that one and the one that can lead to meningitis and the one that can lead to um, your epiglottitis, right? As we talked about in respiratory system. And again, it comes back perfectly to this, polyribosyl ribitol phosphate, PRP capsule. Why? Because again, I want to emphasize this, only the B strains have this. Do not miss that question. Okay, this is a uh, very high yield to, to know. Other things that can have uh, pillide, so it changes those to evade, and that can lead to reinfection like we talked about. Uh, it has LPS, like a regular gram-negative bacteria. It has IgA proteus, like our respiratory infections will have. Symptoms, uh, it usually takes a couple days, but uh, usually you're gonna see nasopharyngitis or sinusitis, otitis media, uh, before we, we get an infection of meningitis with this guy. However, remember, these things are more common with strep pneumo. So in order to differentiate these two, you need to look at the labs. If I were to do gram stain, could you tell the difference between H influenza versus strep pneumo? Absolutely. They're way, way different. So uh, it's very, very easy to differentiate these two. 
You grow this on chocolate auger. Remember, for H. influenza, you have to have factor 5 and factor 10, which is factor 5 or nickel tinamide, so 5 is a nickel, and then uh, factor 10, which is HEMA 10 uh, or HEMIN, uh, and those uh, are important for growing this. Uh, so it is another fastidious or picky eater thing. All right, we also have this vaccine uh, we usually give to two months old babies. Uh, so again, important to emphasize to our parents, we need to get your child vaccinated. All right, now onto this really cool guy, Listeria monocytogenes. So this guy actually is quite fascinating uh, because he has a lot of exceptions to microbiology. So this is a gram positive rod. Um, it's very narrow, uh, uh, or it has a very narrow zone of beta, beta hemolysis uh, on blood auger. So this is very important to know that this is one of the weird things that they like to emphasize for this. It has a strange tumbling motility, and I kind of show this up here um, in, in the top right. You can see these guys kind of like bouncing. Oh, they're all, it's almost like, um, has anyone um, um, like spun a top, uh, like, like when you spin a top and at the very last second it does that kind of fall, you know, when it falls and it kind of bounces around, spins, still spins a little bit, but does a weird little thing. That's sort of like what it does a little bit, but it kind of dances all around. So it's just pretty much uh, uh, someone that's going a little bit crazy on the auger. Uh, that's these guys. Uh, you can see that up here. Uh, that is known as your tumbling motility. It also, once it's inside of cells in your in your CNS or meninges, it actually does an actin rocket propulsion. So it has actin filaments that it makes and that allows it to kind of shoot. If you look at first aid, they have a picture of what that looks like. Um, it's kind of cool. And that allows it to propel pretty much within the cell and from one cell to another. So this is how it avoids the immune system. And that's very high yield to, to know. So neonates um, and elderly, uh, in addition to CM1 deficiency, I have no idea what this was, but it was on his notes. Um, so keep in mind, just straight up memorization that CM1 deficiency can increase this. I actually had a UWorld question and asked this specific thing. And luckily, uh, Dr. Brown had taught this to us. So, uh, so keep that in mind uh, for Listeria monocytogenes, alcoholics, cancer stuff, renal transplants. Um, you get this guy pretty much from uh, ingesting like uh, spoiled milk uh, and dairy products, those sorts of things. That's how you get this, or old cheese, or sometimes vegetables and those sorts of things. So someone that just went on a picnic, now they have meningitis, and it's a gram-positive rod. What is it? It's listeria, uh, most likely. And this is what he looks like, actually, a little bit like here. Looks exactly like that. He's got little eyeballs and everything. <laughs> so virulence, um, these are actually super high yield. So it has internal and A and, uh, a and B. And this uh, allows it to bind to the cadherins. And you might have learned this in histology. So cadherins are important for phagocytes um, as far as your catherine-coated pits, right? So cadherins are actually um, kind of at adhering molecules to, to hold cells together in addition to uh, that allows for um, uh, phagocytosis uh, in phagocytes. This is one of the aspects that, that is required for this guy. And uh, internalin A and B actually binds that, so it allows for phagocytosis. And list, uh, listerilisin O uh, fours pores in phagocytes, in addition to allows its entry into uh, the CNS. And one, obviously, you've probably seen this giant red thing kind of sitting there and beating at the bottom. It's not the same color or size font as all the rest, and I want to emphasize this. This actually is a gram-positive organism that has LPS. Usually we associated LPS with gram-negative. This is the only gram-positive organism with LPS. So just want to emphasize that that could be a sort of high yield. Um, it's kind of a fun fact, but it could be one of those things that Step wants to point out, like what is the only gram-positive uh, organism that has LPS? Listeria, bam, done. You have that answer, nice. Or uh, one of the other great exceptions is what extracellular bacteria has lymphocytic response to it uh, in majority. And remember, that is your Bordetella pertussis. Uh, that's one special thing. And that uh, could be um, misdiagnosed as some sort of viral infection. But uh, those are the kind of the two weird microbiology uh, exceptions. So now other bacterial causes uh, of meningitis. So treponema pallidum. So this is a spirochete meningitis. Uh, this is uh, usually in your tertiary um, infection. And so uh, keep that in mind if someone is left untreated with treponema, there are uh, all the risk factors like we've t talked about in our multi-systems and our skin uh, modules. But those sort of things kind of increase the risk that this person, if left untreated, could have uh, a form of meningitis. 
uh, it will have a VDRL positive test, which is your venereal disease research laboratory test. Um, pretty much this is a microscopic diagnosis uh, of a cross-reactivity of antibodies against uh, tryponema pallidum to uh, cardiolipin. So symptoms, you can have syphilitic meningitis, which is pretty much the same as any other meningitis. Uh, there's other forms of, of these uh, syphilis can be up, uh, upon in here. So meningovascular parenchyma, uh, parenchymatous and uh, gumatous uh, neurosyphilis as well. And uh, keep that in mind, uh, that, is, that is actually pretty high yield to know um, these, these guys uh, can in involve the CNS if, if left untreated. Next is our Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, so etiology for this uh, usually is untreated, obviously the same as uh, tryponema pallidum, obviously it's a different organism. Uh, symptoms usually two to 10 weeks post uh, the skin rash, the erythema chronica migrans, remember your bullseye rash. And uh, how it enters the CNF actually is it, it induces itself phagos uh, into a phagocyte, lives in there and the phagocyte crosses the blood-brain barrier and uh, that then breaks out and can cause meningitis. Where a tryponema pallidum actually is sort of like a corkscrew, it corkscrews its way into uh, or through the meninges, or like in between them. So now on to mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is actually the number one co common cause of chronic meningitis, and this is due to a rupture in subarachnoid space. Um, and in children, uh, it's usually a rapid hematogenous disseminated uh, spread and uh, this is usually following uh, long-term respiratory infections. So just think of your kind of classical tuberculosis, tuberculosis um, vignette, and then plus nuchal rigidity, headache, photophobia, those sorts of things, plus the CSF responses as we have discussed before, which is the protein that's increased, low glucose, and then lymphocytes that are responding, and that will have a nice solid diagnosis of tuberculous um, meningitis. All right, and now on to our viral meningitis. So the first thing I want to discuss is uh, what is viral meningitis? So we usually refer to this as aseptic meningitis. Why? Because we don't have living organisms that are causing meningeal irritation, right? So we have autoimmune possible uh, meningitis. Uh, it's very, very rare that we ever see that. So we usually don't teach uh, that in medical school uh, or we are not taught that. So. Uh, as far as aseptic, we usually refer this uh, to our viral meningitis. So the most common are our enteroviruses like D68 and D70. Um, they're usually very acute and self-limiting. Um, however, the, it is debilitating for a certain uh, odd amount of time. Uh, other things that could cause this are mumps and HSV and armoviruses. Um, and we, we have multiple others. So uh, pretty much what happens is we usually get these uh, viruses. So this is more in reference to your enteroviruses like D68 and D70. So you get your GI mucosal surface colonization and then that makes its way into the blood. And then eventually via that viremia, as we discussed on our first slide of this module, uh, it makes its way into the CNS and then spreads throughout the CNS, causing the, the general meningitis symptoms such as uh, photosensitivity, nuchal rigidity, fever, uh, and those sorts. Sometimes we have a little bit increase of intracranial pressure, um, but usually it's not severe to the point where we see papilledema or anything like that. So uh, our non-polio enteroviruses uh, can be uh, those found within the picornaviruses, such as echovirus and Coxsackie, and then those enterovirus D68 and 70, like I spoke of. So usually this appears in infants and young children. Um, uh, so it's more something associated with summertime or fall time uh, when children are swimming in waters. There was an outbreak in 2014 uh, when I actually started my school and undergrad in Tennessee, there was an outbreak back in my home state of California uh, from this virus, and it caused a little bit of flaccid paralysis. So this is one of the key features that occurs with this is flaccid paralysis. Sometimes it lasts for a, a long time, and there is amount of recovery, but not always. So it's similar to uh, your polio virus, but uh, usually there is that amount of recovery, which makes it a little bit different than a polio virus. And the symptoms that come along are like a respiratory illness or flu-like um, be, uh, just before that paralysis. So herpes viruses, HSV and VCV and CMV and EBV, HHV 6 through 8. Um, as far as all those go for the herpes, the ones that we've discussed thus far in microbiology, HSV 2 is the most common for meningitis, where HSV 1 
being that it's more associated in the head, will follow your cranial nerve five uh, because it lays dormant in your cranial nerve five or trigeminal uh, or root ganglion, right? And then it can cause right up into the brain encephalitis, right? Where HSV2 is more of your genital herpes and that can refer back to your sacral ganglion that it, it lays dormant in and then if that continues on the way back, it can cause meningitis. Uh, just kind of more help, helps you associate which one usually leads to what. However, you remember uh, back when we would discuss the herpes viruses, there's something that under stress they can uh, reappear and then go away and then reappear and go away and reappear and go away. Um, this uh, actually, if it is to cause meningitis, like HSV2 is to recurrent uh, meningitis, we call this recurrent lymphocytic meningitis, also known as as Mollaret's meningitis. So this is a sudden onset, it's lasting two to seven days, it's episodic and reoccurring, um, and usually associated, associated with uh, migraine headaches and such. Uh, so keep this in mind when you hear about someone having recurrent meningitis. This is probably what they're getting at, um, but keep in mind any others that we might be discussing. So now onto our fungal meningitis, uh, some of the uh, important, we will be discussing encephalitis separately, um, but as far as our fungal meningitis, some of the first ones uh, and most important to discuss, uh, as far as all microbiology and pharmacology go in treatment of meningitis, um, this is one of the, the most difficult to, to treat and deal with, um, and there's kind of a strange way that we do treat this, but you will learn that in pharmacology. So this is uh, caused from Cryptococcus neoformis or cryptococcal meningitis. Um, so the, pretty much it's the most common cause of this. And it's transmission, let's go back to respiratory and how we discussed that you get it from inhalation of dust, that is nitrogen rich bird droppings or dirt, um, damp wet areas in the Ohio and Mississippi uh, River Valley, but it could be throughout the United States associated with bur bird dropping, or droppings on bridges or, or buildings or something like that. So keep that in mind uh, during that exposure. So risk factors, I see patients um, usually are the ones that get the encephalitis or meningitis, um, but again, this can occur in regular patients and diabetics, um, but the increased risk if you're immunocompromised. So diagnosis, um, we do PCR, simple for that. Um, India ink, we can actually take the CSF and, and uh, put in some India ink and look under, my, under, under microscopy. And that actually you can see up here, they're almost like little eggs floating around, little fried eggs um, as far as in your CSF. And then um, we, can actually, uh, we can actually see that like thick capsule, the, the India ink kind of negatively um, shows uh, the very thick capsule around this little tiny yeast in the middle. And then uh, we can actually stain that uh, yeast a capsule directly with a mucocarmine stain, which is found up here. And you can see this like um, pink, pink stain here, and that is the uh, actual capsule stain from that. Uh, other things we can actually check for are doing a lysa for cryptococcal antigen. This is actually one of the things that we, we do use to diagnose this. Um, however, the India ink uh, actually is pretty good diagnostic for it as well. But for confirmation, the ELISA is great. So next guy is histoplasma capsulatum. Uh, this is usually occurring as far as meningitis goes in immunocompromised or AIDS or transplant patients, someone on immunosuppressive therapy, chemotherapy, those sorts of things, right? So pretty much decreased immune system. Uh, this usually occurs in Ohio and Mississippi River Valley or uh, Central America uh, is pretty much where those guys are. Symptoms, it could be first a pulmonary system infection with uh, diffuse infiltrates on uh, x-ray. And then uh, diagnosis, pretty much we have to have that uh, histoplasma antigen in the CSF. Uh, usually it doesn't grow on culture. It's very difficult to do so. Uh, we can also do PCR and look for uh, microscopy of macrophages with yeast in them, but that is uh, not super, super specific because uh, there are a few things that actually look sort of like this. Um, but uh, as, far as, as far as diagnostic, we need to have that uh, antigen um, uh, found. So another guy is coccidioides, uh, and the species from these, the most common is imidis, uh, especially in California. So usually central or south, uh, southern Arizona, central valley of California, usually the southwest United States. Uh, usually in, uh, immunocompromised and aid patients have coccidioides as far as infecting the CSF uh, and the meninges. So um, usually it just causes a respiratory illness 
but if it progresses past that into the blood and then into the uh, central nervous system in uh, IC or AIDS patients, then it can cause uh, lots of problems. So diagnosis, pretty much we see a ton of eosinophils. So yeah, yeah yeasts and uh, worms and stuff like that increase eosinophils, but as they don't usually for CSF, where coccidioides has a lot of eosinophils in uh, the CSF. And uh, we also can actually diagnose seeing those spherules, which is this yeast ball down here with a bunch of baby yeast in it. So how do I differentiate this between the last guy? Was the other guy, that was a macrophage. It had a giant nucleus and then it had all the little baby yeast inside of the cytoplasm where this is just simply a big pod with full of sphere, um, spheral uh, little yeast babies inside. That's pretty much uh, what I refer to it as that way. And then uh, how to diagnose, we use a complement fixation test uh, to find this guy. So now on to the encephalitis. So there's a little bit difference between meningitis and encephalitis, obviously, um, because this involves brain tissue, uh, an infection of brain tissue. So obviously we're gonna see some of the neurological aspects. You've finished neurology, so you should understand how if we infect and cause inflammation and swelling and pressure on nerve cells that we can send out action potentials. When we send out action potentials, we can have a change in this person's behavior or action, such as irritability or altered personality. This is something that uh, is very common in encephalitis patients. Uh, a drowsiness, ataxia, even if we're infecting the, or are changing the motor cortex or sensory cortex. Um, tendon reflexes that could be brisk, so this is sort of like an upper motor neuron lesion uh, if we're affecting uh, the Brodmann's four or motor cortex uh, in the anterior or frontal lobes, uh, the prefrontal gyrus. Uh, fever can come of this, obviously, which we're going to see in meningitis anyways. Headaches, which we can also see uh, to some extent in meningitis. And then seizures is something that you actually see more in encephalitis than in meningitis. So as far as um, the encephalitis go, it's mainly viral viral things that lead to encephalitis. We rarely have other things that lead to encephalitis. So this is why I only put up the, the CF, CSF analysis for these guys. So opening pressure is usually normal, sometimes a little bit increased depending on the extent of that uh, inflammation that is occurring. White blood cells are elevated and we're usually seeing within the first 24 hours PMNs responding because there's virus floating around by itself in the CSF and then eventually that invades and affects cells, once it gets inside the cells, then we have to have lymphocytes responding, which are uh, a little bit after. Protein, it's normal, slightly elevated, as we have some sort of inflammation uh, that's coming along with this, so we're going to have some sort of exudate or transudate with this. And then glucose, why? Because, uh, why is it normal? Is because we have a virus. Remember, virus does not eat glucose, so that's going to be normal. So now the most important guy you need to be remembering, there's a bunch of them that we're going to be covering, but I'll be emphasizing the most important ones. So herpes virus, um, we did talk about this a little bit as far as meningitis, but now we're more talking about encephalitis. So herpes virus, encephalitis. So this is your sporadic um, encephalitis. It can be reoccurrent or recurrent uh, encephalitis, and it's very dangerous. These patients can die a lot of the time. And so because we're associated with the head, we're talking about our trigeminal nerve. In our trigeminal nerve, it's most commonly HSV1. So 90% of the time it's HSV1. Other times it's HSV6, which is roseola um, or uh, sixth disease. And where it infects is very important. Whenever I show one of these MRIs, I want you to know exactly where it is because this is testable material. Um, so for exact location that herpes virus usually associates it with, uh, with is your temporal lobe and limbic lobe. So I've put up an, uh, an MRI showing uh, the inflammation that is from herpes virus. This is straight up temporal lobe right here, right? So we have um, uh, our uh, uh, brain stem here found uh, in the middle, and then we have uh, our associated temporal lobes next to it at the level of the eyes, which kind of tells us we're a little bit higher up, uh, and this is someone's uh, associated uh, right side temporal lobe. Other things that can uh, infect uh, as far as herpes go are VZV, so this is multifocal hemorrhagic infarctions or va vasculopathy, usually uh, not as severe as, as, as these guys, but uh, can be pretty bad for a certain amount of time. CMV is associated with AIDS patients or organ transplant patients. So what you see actually is uh, subependymal enhancement and ventriculitis. So it's usually CMV likes 
the venture coals more than anywhere else. Um, and uh, so that's usually where it's going to go. So ependymal cells, which is your choroid plexus, and then the ventricles cause inflammation of the ventricles. In addition, uh, remember that for CMV and torch infections, it causes periventricular calcification. So this is how CMV likes to go. It likes ventricles. You see stuff about ventricles, be thinking of, of this guy. Uh, EBV also can uh, affect uh, the same areas, and then HHV6 is another place, and this usually get in bone marrow transplant patients, um, is, is how you get uh, this guy, or it's a respiratory uh, infection. So symptoms fever, it's altered consciousness and headache, and remember, recurring over and over and over, and this could actually lead to someone's death, so be very, very careful. Or it's more pre-exposed to someone saying, oh, they had cold sores a few months ago and they went away and now they have encephalitis. What would you be thinking of? Obviously, HSV-1. So now on to West Nile virus. So West Nile virus is very, very interesting um, because it's actually, it's carried from mosquitoes. So we're going to get a little bit into our vectors here. Um, and so uh, I just put a little uh, thing from SpongeBob over here on, on the edge for West Nile virus. Um, and I, I thought it was, it was pretty funny. So they were looking for uh, West and so, uh, or East really, but uh, Patrick didn't know they were saying East. He thought they said West. Um, and so that's how I remember my West Nile virus. Is it more associated um, as far as a whole Western United States, but um, as far as the whole United States, it usually occurs in Central. So this is kind of confusing. It's actually called West Nile virus because it was originally found in the Western Nile in uh, Egypt and, and then made its way over, brought over on some mosquitoes uh, and some birds that were, were traveled across the Atlantic Ocean, brought in the United States. And then the first outbreak actually occurred up here in uh, New York in the Northeast United States. And then um, uh, later made its way into Bird Reservoir, which now uh, is more in causing outbreaks in, in the middle United States during summertime. So uh, what is this? Uh, West Nile virus is a flavivirus, and uh, it is enveloped in single-stranded RNA, uh, positive sense, and is the most common epidemic uh, in the United States. So transmission is from our Culex mosquito. I would just remember it's from mosquito. Uh, it's not too important to know that it's Culex. Usually occurs in Summer, why, is because uh, remember during the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, our birds fly south, right? Flying south for the winter. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before, but during summer they come back. And when they come back, they fly through the central United States. So they migrate through this area in order to get up to Canada and, and uh, all those uh, locations above us uh, uh, in the United States. In addition, they kind of, as they're migrating, they stop, make stops here, and get bit by some mosquitoes. And then those mosquitoes transmit uh, this virus over to humans. So the reservoir is birds and transmitted by a mosquito. Um, it's also associated and related to the St. Louis encephalitis virus. This is a virus carried from mosquitoes, or uh, by birds, transmitted by mosquitoes. It is another flavivirus that causes encephalitis. So put all those three together. That's why West Nile virus and St. Louis virus are related. This is very high yield to know. Um, and uh, just some other cool facts is uh, West Nile virus is almost 100% lethal to horses, which is uh, super random, but yeah. Uh, symptoms, so it's very little neuroinvasive. However, if it does, it usually involves um, uh, what we're about to discuss. So on MRI, it usually involves the thalamus and the basal ganglia, so you can see motor symptoms, in addition to further down in the brainstem. And this is the only one that actually involves further down into the spinal cord. So if you see something like basal ganglia, motor, and thalamus, and then spinal cord, you have West Nile virus. You don't need to actually confuse that with anything else. Spinal cord is the big guy uh, for that one. And then further, as it uh, involves its way down into the spinal cord, this can actually cause acute flaccid paralysis. So this is something that's uh, really different from a lot of our other things we're about to discuss. Polio will come up and it'll be very similar, um, but this is something transmitted from mosquitoes, so look for exposure. Acute flaccid paralysis, we see basal ganglia, thalamus, and spinal cord involvement, you have West Nile virus. St. Louis encephalitis virus, so SLEV, uh, this is a flavivirus, like I said, it is related to West Nile virus, and uh, it occurs in Canada, USA, Central Southern Amer uh, America, and transmission is mosquito again, and uh, for diagnosis you need the antibodies, uh, IgM antibodies, against this virus in the serum or CSF, and uh, 
usually the MRI is normal. However, if it involves anything as far as the brain specific, excuse me, specifically, um, it will be the substantia nigra. So I've emphasized this. Here's our little Mickey Mouse of our midbrain, right? Um, so this little Mickey Mouse here, right? And uh, you can see the little bit of change in the substantia nigra, you can see. So here's our cerebral aqueduct. That's how I know that we are in the midbrain. And here uh, we have this um, very bright spot here located here in the substantia nigra. And as if you were to look in your neuro uh, textbook, you would see that that is the actual location of the substantia nigra. So that's how I kind of back up my diagnosis for this. So Eastern equine encephalitis virus. So this guy actually is pretty high yield for uh, the encephalitis viruses. Um, so this is an alpha virus. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard that before. This might be the first time you've heard it, but uh, it's also known as a toga virus. I'm sure you've heard that before. Uh, it occurs in the United States and Southern, um, Southern America and Caribbean. So we can actually get this here, um, but it's a very, very low um, incidence that, that we find this. So transmission, mosquitoes again, birds are the reservoir. So as they're migrating north um, or south uh, can bring this uh, disease to us. Symptoms, so pretty much brainstem is uh, often involved. Um, this is not involving your spinal cord, so um, this, is, uh, this is very, very similar to what we saw in West Nile, except it doesn't involve your, your spinal cord. And CSF, so this is actually really important. This is one of the diagnoses, and I don't want you to miss this. Uh, this is very high yield and a trick, okay? So I want you to look at this very careful. When you see a CNS lesion, right, or uh, like meningitis or encephalitis, right, and they do a spinal tap, okay, and they pull out the stuff, right, I want you to be very, very, very careful at what you find, okay. This is a virus that has very high neutrophils all the time, right. Remember we talked about first 24 hours sometimes in the viral infections, uh, then after 24 hours we have a lot of PM or, uh, neutroph or lymphocytes and stuff responding. This actually just has a lot of neutrophils in general. So neutrophil predominant, and this is one of the exceptions, and uh, they, love, uh, they love testing that, uh, that aspect of this. And then you can also see RBCs. This is one of the only place, uh, places you're gonna see bleeding into uh, your CSF. So what do you see on CSF if you have RBCs and you break down those RBCs? Xanthochromia. So this is what I was mentioning earlier when we went over that. So diagnosis, you look for anti-EEE or Eastern Equine Encephalitis Virus, um, uh, IgM antibodies in CSF, and then it involves your thalamus, basal ganglia, and brainstem, similar to West Nile, but remember, um, as far as the spinal cord, that is not involved in this guy. But keep keep an eye out for normal glucose, but neutrophils that are that are high. Um, that's uh, really weird, and that's one of the, the diagnostic tools to uh, point this guy out. Now onto Western equine encephalitis. This is very pretty low yield actually. So this is another alpha virus or toga virus found in the same locations, uh, carried from mosquitoes. You'll have a uh, febrile illness and then you'll have a viral illness that can lead to encephalitis. Um, and usually has very, very small per, uh, mortality percentages. All those other guys, Wasp Nile actually has a decently high mortality. Uh, Eastern equine has a very high, St. Louis has a pretty high um, mortality percentage. And then Western equine has a very small one. Um, it is not zero, it is, uh, there are some people that have died to this, uh, but it's very small. So pretty much, again, look for those antibodies in CSF, uh, and then sometimes, uh, or they'll just have the, the normal regular viral CSF. Now, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, so this is another alpha virus, usually in southern U.S., central uh, South America, mosquito, look for the antibodies. And then this guy actually is the only one that has no mortality. Um, and uh, so there, there's no reported cases of anyone that has this that has died. So it is kind of, uh, it causes encephalitis, um, but then it uh, dissipates and, and resolves. So California encephalitis group. So this is uh, etiology. These are your bunya viruses. So if you can think of uh, another bunya viruses, uh, virus that we have discussed in our respiratory system, uh, you can now hook these two together and put the whole big picture of what are your bunya virus uh, infections that can cause. So the infections are your um, California encephali encephalitis virus, La Crosse, Jamestown Canyon, and Tanya. Um, and uh, that, that is one found in Russia. So you'll see focal neurological disease, hemiparesis, aphasia, dysarthria, chorea. So this is something we haven't come across as far as some of the encephalitis. We did talk a little bit about generally encephalitis, right? Um, but most of these other guys have been affecting your brain stem and basal ganglia. So they have general overall motor stuff. But it hasn't been very specific like hemiparesis 
or aphasia, meaning more on the left side of your brain involved, or dysarthria, difficult uh, in talking, or chorea, which is abnormal movement. Um, those sorts of things are more specific to some of these uh, later two uh, virus groups. So pretty much diagnosis of them in CSF or serum, and then uh, we can also do PCR. So Japanese encephalitis virus, so flavivirus, we're back to our flaviviruses, is Asia, Pacific, uh, Western Pacific, and Australia. Mosquitoes, altered consciousness, and, and seizures often come from this. And then the same focal neurological things as we saw on the last slide. So MRI is totally normal. CNS is pretty much the normal viral stuff. And we can see those antibodies. So now on to uh, one of the last guys is our Colorado tick fever virus. This is a Rio virus. This is group three, uh, as you remember from your Baltimore classification. And if you can think of what other uh, virus do we know of that is in the Rio viruses. Well, hopefully you remember that our other Rio virus is your rotavirus, which was found in your GI tract. This is severe uh, diarrhea and, and vomiting that is associated with this guy. Um, and please refer to, back to the GI module videos uh, if you forgot about that guy. Um, so these guys are your triple capsid viruses, remember? Um, and they uh, carry uh, multiple segmented genome. And uh, that is your um, group of double-stranded RNA virus. So they're found in the western United States and Canada, like up high in the mountains where you find this Colorado tick fever virus, um, and it's carried from a tick as to why it's called the Colorado tick fever virus. It's carried from Dermenkenter andersoni. Now if you can remember from our multi-systems video, this is a, um, a tick that carries our Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So if you can remember what this tick looks like, it's got that transformer um, looking uh, shield on his back, you know, that angry uh, Decepticon or whatever. Um, and so that's your Decepticon Dermenkenter andersoni, right? So that's how we, uh, we can uh, remember that guy. So symptoms are nuchal rigidity, pretty much all the meningitis or encephalitis-like um, uh, uh, symptoms with uh, IgM ELISA for diagnosis. So now on to one of the more high yield things, and you're probably going to get a question on this for sure, um, as it is very important to know, and I will emphasize that why. So this is your rabies virus, um, and this is your rhabdovirus, and it is your group uh, five, which is your single-stranded RNA negative sense virus, um, or one of those groups in that group. And transmission is infected from animal bites like bats and skunks and raccoons, those sorts of things that have this virus replicating within their nervous tissue and their salivary glands um, and such. So uh, this is actually what they look like. They're bullet shaped um, uh, virions. Uh, I almost look like they, they almost look like candy corn sort of. Um, that's how uh, I remember that guy. And uh, I put this picture up here. I don't know if anyone recognized this. I don't know if I'm getting a little old or something. But this is actually from a, a movie that I saw when I was a kid. I'm sure you might have heard of it. It's known as Old Yeller. Um, and so this is a really sad story. He had this beautiful dog that uh, uh, his name was Old Yeller, this little kid, and he grew up with him. And when he started getting older, this dog actually ended up getting bit and, and contracted rabies. And so they had to actually put him down. That's one of the sad uh, things of the movie, and I'm sorry if I just ruined that for you. If you wanted to go check that out, uh, it actually is a good movie, though. Um, it'll sure make you cry. <laughs> so pathogenesis uh, from the bite, pretty much uh, you get this virus pretty much laid down onto uh, muscle and nerve tissue that allows for a replication within that muscle or the nerve tissue. And then it binds the uh, acetylcholine receptors, and then eventually uh, crosses the uh, the junction between the nerve and the motor, the neuromuscular junction, and begins its retrograde axonal transport. It makes its way up. Um, if you can think what tra uh, carries this uh, guy retrograde as far as what proteins. So this gets into a little bit of biochemistry or histology uh, as far as your transport. Um, so I try to emphasize this with my DES groups as far as uh, what travels anterograde and what travels uh, retrograde. So retrograde is actually the, the motor protein that carries this is your dynein. So I always remember that you dine in, right? So if, as if you're coming back in, uh, that is your retrograde transport. That is for dynein. And then you kill to get ahead. So K for kinesin. 
Uh, kinesin is the protein to get ahead or go forward or anterior grade axonal transport. And then uh, it makes its way up through that uh, motor neuron or alpha motor neuron, makes its way into the anterior horn uh, and uh, pops out of that soma and then ascends into the secondary neuron, makes its way up the spinal cord and into the brain, and that is very problematic. So diagnosis, we need that rabies antigen um, and we need to see, we can also do a skin biopsy to see the negri bodies within the, uh, the nervous tissue. Remember those are intracytoplasmic inclusions, eosinophilic inclusions, and uh, yeah. Uh, we also can do a corneal smear for rabies antigen. However, this isn't really good because if it's already made it up to the cornea, uh, that's a problem. Uh, that person could be dying and uh, no matter what we do, it, it's, it's gonna be uh, too problematic. And then uh, we can also see uh, rabies neutralizing antibody in CSF or serum. As far as treatment, this is where you actually get a lot of questions. So it's important to know when you give these vaccines and what you give to them, uh, depending on their immune status. Pretty much you wash the wounds. Obviously, you want to clean the wound and prevent abscesses from pasturella and stuff like that, right? Um, and then eventually, uh, once you, you've cleaned it and, and removed it with so soap and water uh, and clean that, then what you need to do is actually give this person uh, some sort of immunoglobulins or booster vaccines. And so that depends on has this person been immunized before or um, have they not? And so for the non-immunized, this is the more of where they get questions from. For the non-immunized, you actually have to give one dose of uh, immunoglobulin uh, into the wound site. So we give immunoglobulin uh, against rabies into the wound site and then uh, the remaining of the things that we need to give are uh, distally. So what we do is we give four doses of vaccine starting on day one, which is the next day, three, seven, and 14. So I just remember one day, one half a week, one week, and then two weeks. That's how I remember uh, the time frame for these guys. So one day, one half a week, which is three days, uh, one week, which is seven days, and two weeks, which is 14. That is when we uh, kind of give uh, the vaccines for it. However, remember one dose of immunoglobulin at the wound site. If this person already is immunized, then we don't give them immunoglobulin. We just boost their uh, immune system with two boosters of vaccine on the day of the bite and on day three, uh, which is uh, three days later. So uh, extra info about this guy. Uh, this is why we have to give this. If you if you have uh, if a patient comes in, they've been bit by a dog, and you decide to not uh, give them any of this, you're killing this patient. Literally legit. If they get rabies, they're dead. Uh, within seven days of symptoms presentation, you will die. Um, and so this is a uh, rabies virus is actually the only 100% lethal virus if left untreated. Yes, I am saying this in, in confidence. It is 100% lethal. Uh, only people that survive this are the ones that we treat uh, with this guy here, and it's very problematic. The second you start showing symptoms like the sal extra salivation and the change in uh, mentation, um, then at that point that person will die no matter what we do. We've only had one recorded case of a little girl that had gotten rabies, started showing symptoms, and what we had to do is we had to induce her into a coma to diminish all her metabolic processes in her body at the point that then we in infused her uh, with uh, the, the, the vaccines to build her immune system, see if it, they can fight it. So she was left with uh, some paralysis and stuff like that, uh, decrease in her mental ability and uh, cognitive abilities, uh, but she is alive, uh, which is amazing. It's the only recorded case where once symptoms presented that we we're actually able to save a patient. So next is our measles virus. So um, usually very, very rare that measles is ever involved in uh, encephalitis. However, we do have this one complication of measles, and I did mention this when we talked about it in our respiratory and our skin modules, is that it can lead to uh, a, a case known as subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So what is this? It's slow progression. Uh, sometimes it's years and years, up to 15, 20, 30 years later that this actually occurs, but sometimes it could be a month. Right? It could be a month after they had measles and, and this could start showing signs, um, but you need that history of measles, right? Uh, in addition, you have um, uh, that decrease in the incidence overall worldwide because of this vaccination um, uh, of, to measles, so we actually don't get measles, so that's, that's nice. Uh, however, uh, what we find, so uh, what causes this is we have measles infection and we clear the infection. However, we have uh, immunoglobulins that are floating around in our blood and stuff, to the point that if they make their way into the um, 
nervous system or into the CSF, they can actually damage uh, our brain tissues and that can cause panencephalitis. And so in the CSF, it could be normal, however, you might see increase in immunoglobulins and these ones are specific to measles virus. So as far as pathogenesis for subacute sclerosing panencephalitis are immunoglobulins uh, against the measles virus. Uh, so keep that in mind in case they uh, throw out a question for you. So now on to our polio virus. So this is something that's very high yield to know uh, just in general. It's something that we have um, pretty much almost eradicated from the world. However, there's some places that have epidemics still um, being spread around like in Africa and, and the Middle East and sometimes in Asia. And we have cases as well. So polio virus, uh, it's fecal orally normally transmitted. Um, however, sometimes when there's severe spread, like in epidemics, it can be pharyngeal spread. There's a little bit of change in this virus's ability to spread from one person to another. The symptoms um, are usually are mild cases of GI. But however, um, there are some amount of um, cases where you have meningitis, which is about 8% of the time. And then there's the paralytic disease. So this is about 1%. So there's... Uh, Back in uh, the early uh, earlier 1900s, uh, 1930s, 1940s, um, there were a lot of cases of polio being spread around, especially in the United States, uh, due to uh, cases such as poverty and all those things after uh, or during the Great Depression and, and, and sorts. And so um, a lot of children actually uh, did get this virus. So but children are very prone to, to picking up this virus because you get it from from water, water supply and stuff like that. And the kids are real dirty, uh, fecal orally uh, as far as uh, that goes. And then uh, they ended up getting a lot of people just getting sick, right? They get sick and they're fine. But then uh, there were so many cases that 1% of them actually ended up having paralytic disease. So what does polio do? So this goes back to a little bit of neuro that you guys learned in your neuro lectures as far as what diseases affect what of the motor systems. And so what polio does, it actually infects our anterior horn somas, the, the cell bodies, right? Specifically cell bodies, not axons or anything like that, but the cell bodies of our alpha motor neurons. So remember that our alpha motor neurons are our lower motor neurons. So if we damage our lower motor neurons, we will see a lower motor neuron lesion. Uh, so if you can just think of that as flaccid paralysis, as your fasciculations and fibrillations decreased, uh, reflexes, if it's uh, associating with uh, a dermatome and stuff like that, so uh, just to associate that with uh, paralytic disease. Um, if it involved upper respiratory, so uh, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. So to, if it involved those levels, it can involve the diaphragm. Now at that point, uh, we needed to give respiratory uh, aid to uh, the children or adults even who had this, if they have paralysis of that general area. And we put them in this thing known as the iron lung. I'm sure you've heard about that. And that is that guy. And this guy's got his little mirror so he can see people as you're, you're talking to him. So they kind of get used to the world upside down uh, from, from that guy. And I can't imagine that being uh, overjoyous. Um, this is actually my grandmother right here. Um, when she was a, a, a child, she actually uh, contracted polio and had uh, some paralysis of her feet muscles specifically. Um, so some of the, the motor neurons that went to her lower foot muscles actually uh, were a little bit more paralyzed than anything else. She was still able to walk and stuff like that, but it did uh, decrease her ability to uh, have normal uh, foot, uh, foot movements and, and placement and stuff like that. Um, and that's her with her little dog. <laughs> So diagnosis, uh, CSF, uh, pretty much we look for PMNs early, lymphocytes following that, increased protein and normal glucose, the same as uh, any uh, viral entity for CSF infections. Um, and then we can also do PCR of that CSF. Now, as far as why is polio virus decreasing, is because we've been giving vaccines. Uh, in the United States, usually as far as our polio vaccine, we give our Sulk, which is Sulk vaccine, which is the inactivated form of vaccine. However, in, uh, since it's a lot cheaper and in more uh, prone areas of getting this, we want to have stronger herd immunity by giving them the Sabin, which is your oral poliovirus vaccine um, or OPV. But so uh, this is a, it's a live attenuated. And uh, this I, way I remember that the Sabin is your oral uh, uh, is that you your Sabin more lives. Uh, saving more lives with live attenuated, right? And this is important to understand the concept of, of vaccines. I'm sure you guys remember this, uh, but I just want to point this out here, is that uh, if you have an inactivated um, vaccine, pretty much just pieces of uh, your virus, then pretty much all we're going to have is phagocytes 
bring it in, break it up into proteins, present them on MHC2, and that presents to T helper cells, which talks to B cells to make antibodies. So we only have a humoral response. However, if we have an act, uh, live attenuated, this is a live virus. It's attenuated, it doesn't cause severe disease. However, when we give this, um, it actually infects cells, and so it's growing within cells. So what responds to that is our CD8 cells. So this is our cellular immunity. And when they respond to that, um, because proteins that get chopped up in there are, uh, are presented on MHC1 molecules, and our CD8 cells go, oh, this shouldn't be here, and they kill that cell and they create that memory uh, of cellular immunity. In addition, you will have this virus floating around, picked up from macrophages and presented in the same way we discussed a second ago as you're inactivated. And so you'll have not only um, a cellular response, but also that humoral, and that is more associated and found with your live attenuated because you have to have that re uh, replication with cells for that cellular immunity. If it's just the salt, which is inactivated, you're only gonna have that humoral response. Um, and so that's why the Sabin one save, sabins more lives, right? And that's how we remember that. And here's a little baby getting the, the oral one. Oh, look at his little cheeks. All right, so now on to our focal CNS infections. Um, uh, we're almost getting down to uh, the grind here. So uh, CSF shunt infections, so this is more associated with uh, children that have uh, hydrocephalus or premature birth, um, something like that, where we have to go in and place a shunt uh, for that CSF. So this is uh, infants that have cerebellar problems that push into the fourth ventricle, or we have some sort of stenosis of your cerebral aqueduct, or we have arachnoid granulations from TB, meningitis, or all those sorts of things uh, can increase uh, fluid within your um, within your brain, and that causes hydrocephalus, either obstructive or non-obstructive, right? So what we need to do is we need to take a little hose, hook it into there so we can take some of that CSF and drain it down into the abdominal cavity. When we do this surgery, we open them up and we put that hose in there, uh, and we have a little valve behind the ear that we can kind of control, and then uh, we are putting something invasively into uh, this child or, or infant or even adult if, if that, that is a problem. And so when we're doing that, obviously we can have very sterile environments, but not always is that the case. And so if you can remember back to your cardio section, as far as when we put in valves in someone's heart, what was the most likely organism to invade um, that prosthetic heart valve? And hopefully you're thinking of staph epidermidis. And that is correct because staph epidermidis is the most common to cause a heart valve or a prosthetic heart valve infection. It, also is the most common thing for our CSF shunt infections as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, both of these are associated with kind of surgery. This is the, the surgeon's uh, bane of existence pretty much is staph epidermidis. It really destroys a lot of surgical implants and such. Other thing could be staph aureus because it's everywhere. And then uh, there's a bunch of other organisms, but they're, they're not as common and less likely to be uh, tested on. And usually this occurs as colonization at surgery time. Um, so, so keep in mind that uh, you can also have abdominal um, infections that can travel up this CSF shunt and make its way into the brain. Um, and so those sorts of things are more associated with infections first in the, G, uh, in the GI system or uh, peritoneum that make its way up there. And that's where you're going to get more of your E. coli or um, your B. serious, uh, or not B. serious, I'm sorry, your um, Bacteroides fragilis, Klebsiella proteus, Pseudomonas, those sorts of things can make its way from the GI up into this one. So now uh, on to brain abscesses. So uh, usually they gave you a little bit of specifics as far as where these guys are located and what's most likely uh, causing it. Um, as far as the locations, frontal, temporal, multiple, and varying, um, that's not really helpful to kind of point out what is the most likely thing there. Uh, it's more associated with what did this person have before that is most likely leading to this brain abscess. Um, but most commonly overall is staph aureus. So staph aureus is the most common brain abscess out of everybody. Following that is streptococcus. Um, but if you have in the frontal lobe, this is more associated with sinusitis and dental abscesses. So you're thinking, what things are associated with sinusitis and abscesses? Well, streptococcus for sure. Staph aureus, like I said, is most common. So put those two together and uh, you'll most likely have a diagnosis. If you have to pick uh, between one of them, um, right? So if you had a stem person came in uh, and they have focal um, lesion in, in, in their brain, it's in the frontal lobe or wherever, it doesn't even matter. Uh, but 
just say frontal lobe for, for example, what is the most likely organism, then at that point you want to say staph. However, if it says this person had sinusitis, um, at that point then I would say, okay, it's probably strep, because remember strep is the most common cause of sinusitis and that can make its way up into the brain. If it's a dental abscess, remember abscesses are your staph aureus, so that is also associated with that. For temporal lobe, otitis media, otitis media, think, what is the most common cause of otitis media? Streptococcus, you win. Mastoiditis, um, uh, so this is another thing that uh, can, can uh, be ver uh, very problematic. And uh, so this is uh, an inflammation of your uh, mastoid. And uh, this actually uh, can be caused from uh, your strep uh, as well and some of these other bacteria. Uh, as far as multiple all over the place, Staph aureus is most common. And then uh, if you have infective endocarditis, you need to look at risk factors to determine what type of endocarditis they have that then could lead to strep viridans. Um, so if this person is an IV drug user, they have a, a, a rapid fever, and then they have a new heart murmur, and then we look and they have a brain enhancing lesion in the brain, all this puts together, first I'm thinking, okay, what is the diagnosis for endocarditis? Well, probably on the right side in the tri or on the tricuspid valve, and it's most likely associated with his IV drug use, and that's most likely staph. Then it made its way somehow into the brain, either through the lungs and then back um, through the heart and then back up into uh, the brain, or it has crossed across um, through a patent foraminal bowel or something like that, um, and that could uh, increase abscesses uh, from uh, staph aureus. And then uh, congenital heart disease as well, lung abscesses, those things kind of increase risk for abscesses all over the place. And then varying, so trauma, penetrating wound, uh, remember that is going to be your kind of penetrating and uh, abscess wounds, which are your staph aureus and clostridia as well, but that is less on the, the high yield stuff. Fungal, I'm thinking of candida and aspergillosis, uh, cryptococcus can also cause this, histoplasma and blastomyces, dermatitis, remember blastomyces is the one that has broad base budding for blastomyces. Um, and then aspergillosis has our acute angle, um, acute angles, uh, branching hyphae with uh, septae and cryptococcus. We know what that guy looks like. We already looked at him. Histoplasma we did. And then candida is just everywhere. Uh, for diagnosis, we look for what is known as a ring enhancing lesion. So there's only a few things that lead to ring enhancing lesions, bacterial abscesses, toxoplasma gondii, which we'll be discussing in just a little bit. And then lastly, our tumors, some tumors like um, glioblastoma multiforme can have a very large ring enhancing lesion that spreads across from left to right um, hemispheres and that is, is very bad. Um, so those things are pretty much what you're thinking of. That's a hookup of path and micro. Um, so keep that in mind. As far as abscesses, remember lung abscess and brain abscess, if they're left in there for a long time, this can lead to systemic AA amyloidosis but usually with brain abscess, we treat uh, and get rid of those pretty quickly, so it's not a problem. So we see a ring enhancing lesion with cerebral edema around that area, and that is a, a nice description of brain abscess. So lastly, for um, the bacterial things, uh, we have our subdural empyema. Um, so this is very commonly caused from streptococci more than it is staph. So uh, keep that in mind. This is uh, something they like getting at because we're so used to picking staph uh, unless it's like respiratory, then we're picking strep. Uh, well, um, we've been doing a lot of staph in the past few slides, but this guy for empyema, strep is most common. Diagnosis, uh, you see a high density interhemispheric fissure. So pretty much uh, if we were to draw the brain, so here's the hemispheres, right? And we're looking down at the brain that is a horrible brain, right? So this is uh, the brain and all its little gyri and sulci or whatever. I have no idea what that is. Uh, pretty much uh, it lights up all in this middle area here, and that's an interhemispheric fissure. So uh, lastly, as, as far as from uh, the encephalitis uh, stuff, um, we have a, a few other things to discuss. So prions, so these are um, a, pretty much a normal glycoprotein, which is the PRPC, uh, which has a lot of alpha helixes and decreased beta helixes, uh, has turned into infectious agents. Uh, and these are no, uh, the pretty much uh, infectious agents with no nucleic acid genome, and that has now become our infectious glycoprotein, our PRPSC, uh, and this is decreased alpha and increased beta he helixing. And uh, pretty much uh, what happens is it causes an aggregation of neurons, which are known as myeloid plaques, um, and that can cause vacuolization in the cortex and cerebellum, and it'll have all sorts of problems, uh, change in mood, activity, um, 
memory and all sorts of things. Pretty much everything gets uh, destroyed and it's very quickly. So the disease that uh, the, are associated with prions are your transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Uh, these are infectious agents that only exert their effects on CNS. So be careful if there's a question that says, oh, what infection only exerts their effects in the CNS? Maybe they'd be describing this whole long, stupid vignette, um, but then ask you that simple question at the end. Remember that a lot of things can invade and infect a lot of things, uh, right? So I could take staph um, and have it affect all over the place. I could take Borrelia, right? And that could cause skin, it could cause joint problems. I could take something. So think of, think of an infection that affects only usually one place. So maybe Neisseria, uh, no, not Neisseria, but maybe like uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, right? Neisseria gonorrhea is usually associated with like uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, pretty much uh, urinary or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, genital uh, infections, right? And then sometimes, very rarely, it can cause pharyngitis. So usually that's usually limited to a couple things, right? But it does infect multiple things, right? <clears throat> and it can involve multiple different types of epithelium and all sorts of stuff where you can find that guy. Well, this only in neural tissue does it affect. It cannot infect epithelium, it cannot infect your GI tract, it cannot infect uh, you know, your eyes or all sorts of stuff like that. I, well, I mean, it can be found in your eyes and your cornea, um, but usually just, it's only found in neural tissue uh, and it's only effects in the CNS as far as disease. So what are these diseases? Kreutz, uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob uh, disease, uh, we have Kuro and uh, mad cow. So Kuru is actually uh, uh, like a tribal illness, a spongiform encephalopathy where they like eat each other um, and that's how they contract this disease. Mad cow, uh, as you can see up in this comic in the top right, that is mad cow. Uh, scrapie is found in sheep and we call it scrapie because it causes the sheep to go a little bit crazy and scrape off all their, their skin um, on, on trees and stuff like that. And then uh, we have new variant CJD. So this is actually the one when humans ingest mad cow brain, um, we can actually uh, get this new variant uh, CJD, which is very similar to Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Uh, symptoms, it's nonspecific prodrome. So sometimes uh, you can ingest the brain and then years and years and years go by, right? So nothing shows up. However, once the symptoms start showing, you'll have prodromal symptoms and very rapidly you'll have profound dementia, memory loss, impaired judgment, motor changes, um, behavior to the point where uh, you start going really crazy and it's really rapid and then you die um, and that's very problematic and that's how prions go so it's a very long time where there's nothing that happens and then once you start showing symptoms it's rapid within a year you'll die um, diagnosis uh, for this guy you got to do that blood test for uh, variant CJD chemoluminescence uh, um, uh, Eliza as well. And then I kind of brought up a little bit of information. This is front of your general microbiology, and this is a question they actually could ask you. So we get this diagnosis of a prion disease or transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. What could we have done to prevent um, or kill off this thing, or how do we get rid of it? This actually showed up on finals, so I keep this in mind. So re it's resistant to formaldehyde, uh, heat, boiling ethanol, boiling ethanol, ionizing radiation, those things uh, do not kill this. So it's very, very resistant to a lot of things. However, it is sensitive to phenol, which is really uh, bad stuff. Uh, bleach, uh, also lye, which is NaOH or sodium hydroxide. And then we can autoclave it for over an hour and a half. And uh, sometimes uh, we can get rid of prions, but not always is autoclaving uh, enough to get rid of these guys. All right, so we're gonna jump right into our last section on parasitic infections of the CNS. So there are a few that you should know. Um, there are some that are more high yield on this list than others, and I'll definitely point those out. So the first on our list is Toxoplasma gondii. This causes a toxoplasmosis. Um, pretty much this will lead to brain abscesses, especially in immunocompromises, like uh, compromised patients, like AIDS patients, um, and how that shows up on a CAT scan are re-enhancing lesions. Uh, which pretty much describe there's fluid found in there and there's usually localized edema around um, that ring. Uh, that's why they call it ring. Um, the symptoms are focal deficits, psychosis, and sometimes seizures, um, but usually the focal deficits and psychosis are the predominant feature for this. Um, uh, next is Naglaria, uh, which causes primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, or PAM. 
the transmission is from fresh water activities, uh, such as water that goes up the nose, um, and this le allows this organism to make its way to the olfactory bulbs, make its way following causing necrosis and hemorrhage, cribriform plate, and into the brain. And this is known as your brain-eating amoeba. I'm sure you might have heard this. Now, uh, this usually uh, accounts for a very small amount of death each year, but uh, it's still found in the United States, so don't swim in ponds and lakes unless you know it's safe, um, which actually you have no idea if it is, um, but just try to stay away from that as, as much as possible. Uh, like up in uh, places uh, in the mountains and such like that. Next is uh, acanth amoeba. This is granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. Uh, usually occurs in immunocompromised patients with granulomas in the brain, um, and that's pretty much all you need to know for that guy. Next is pl plasmodium falciparum. This is caused is uh, cerebral malaria, and the pathogenesis is where there are schizonts that bind to endothelial cells that cause rupture and toxin release which then uh, from this point on allows our immune system to respond by increasing tumor necrosis factor and macrophages of release and nitric oxide, which then inhibits neurotransmitter uh, release. And uh, this can cause unarousable coma and death. So this is why plasmodium falciparum we need to definitely treat as quickly as possible. There are gonna be small amount of cases in the United States, except for those who are traveling to other places and not taking the appropriate prophylaxis. Next, and most importantly from all of these, is tinea solium. Uh, this uh, causes neurosister cirrhosis, and uh, pretty much what is found are cysts, and this organism causes these cystic spaces to be formed as sort of a bubble to where they can hide away from neutrophils and eosinophils, and they inhibit their entry into that tissue to fight them. So this multiple cystic space often calcifies so we can find that on cat scan and this is a way different than ring enhancing lesions which is like edema around the area this is calcification specifically and because of that calcification it usually leads to chronic epilepsy so a patient will come in there maybe they're an immigrant from another country such as south america or such and they're having chronic epilepsy and we look that they have a fever and symptoms of brain involvement and we do a CAT scan and see these calcifications and cystic spaces, we now have neurosister sarcosis. Definitely go on Google to check out the pictures of this. This is actually kind of interesting to, to see what it looks like on CAT scan. And how you get this guy is specifically ingesting eggs of tinea solium. So you actually can only get neurosister sarcosis if you inge in, um, ingest the eggs of these guys. If you ingest the larva of them, then the larva just becomes worms and causes a tapeworm infection uh, in, in the GI tract. Um, treatment for neurosister sarcosis specifically is albendazole. There are other treatments for the GI tract infection that you can use, but uh, as far as neurosister sarcosis is specifically albendazole, not mabendazole, albendazole. And remember, uh, the key feature for this was epilepsy and seizures, where the key feature up here was the focal deficits and psychosis. Lastly are two forms of infections that we need to discuss, and those are eye infections uh, and parotid infections. So for the eye infections, we've talked about conjunctivitis in our respiratory section, and the most common cause of that pink eye conjunctivitis is adenovirus, uh, and is a very common cause of common cold as well. Um, and then lastly, uh, less likely, but still probable, are chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea. So trachoma is formed from your A, and A through C strains of chlamydia, and uh, specifically, these guys are really based on their time frame. So I know I have three to 14 days because it's the true number, but I really want you to remember that it's usually around 10 to 14 days. So if they write a stem of an infant that is 10 to 14 days old that has now presenting conjunctivitis or something oozing from their eyes and they're red and such like that, I'm going, this person is infant has conjunctivitis and they're 10 to 14 days old. At that point, since it's now kind of past five days, past five days, at that point, I'm thinking chlamydia is the most common cause. So chlamydia 
has to be intracellular and it replicates very slowly. And so it takes a while for that replication to cause enough damage to actually see conjunctivitis in an infant. So that's why it takes longer, usually 10 to 14 days. Where Neisseria gonorrhea is bacterial, it can make its way, I know it's intracellular, but it's make its way into the cells, uh, especially macrophages uh, that come into the tissue and everything. And at that point, Neisseria gonorrhea can cause conjunctivitis uh, very rapidly, actually within one to five days. So if you have a two-day-old infant that comes in with conjunctivitis, I'm looking for Neisseria gonorrhea as the most common uh, or most likely organism there. And they will put both answers uh, as answer choices, so definitely be checking out the time frame for that particular question. Another guy is more Xella cataralis, showed up in our respiratory section, and that causes cataracts. Bipolaris hawaiensis and Fusarium incarnatum. These guys cause contamination of eye drops that can uh, infect the eye um, and can lead to blindness. The way I remember hawaiensis is I look at palm tree, uh, I see a palm tree, and I just remember hawaiensis. Okay, um, next is our parotid infections. So uh, infection of the parotid glands is usually the virus called mumps virus. It's a paramyxovirus. It has helical nu nucleocapsid, single-stranded RNA, negative sense, like our paramyxoviruses, as we've discussed in respiratory section, and it's enveloped. Uh, there are proteins involved, uh, found within this guy, uh, important for its virulence. Definitely check out a respiratory section for a recap on those guys. Pretty much uh, it's for entry, for leaving or exiting of uh, the cell, and then fusion of the cells to kind of uh, escape the immune system. Uh, this guy involves your parotid, so it can cause parotitis, and then uh, this also can infect the orchids, or also known as your testicles, um, of, and especially in males. If this occurs in like in a young adult male, that can cause and lead to sterility. So keep in mind, uh, if you have someone that comes in with uh, infection uh, of their parotid glands, they have swollen parotid glands, they're very painful, uh, they have a fever, and they're young adult male, if they ask you complications, be looking for something involving sterility or orchitis if they're asking for the particular infection. Uh, that's very, very high yield for mumps. Diagnosis, uh, all our viral uh, tests like PCR and ELISA, and then prevent with MMR vaccine. Med School Tutor! You're at SGU, and you're thinking about step one. There are so many resources and so many opinions. How do you know which path to take? You've worked so hard, and you deserve to match into the specialty of your dreams. Med School Tutors has helped nearly a 1,000 SGU students get their best scores on their CBSE and USMLEs through highly personalized one-on-one -on -one tutoring and individualized advice. Our SGU students see average Step 1 score increases of over 30 points when working with us. Scores that are their tickets to competitive residency spots around the country. Schedule your free phone consult today to be matched with your tutor. Med School Tutors, get where you want to go. All right, and that completes our module on CNS microbiology and all the modules of microbiology. I'm Clark McLaughlin. Hit subscribe and like at the bottom. Thanks for watching CK Med. And before you guys go, I want to congratulate you on making it all the way this way. You now have your finals coming up and you're ready to go kill those exams. Uh, if you uh, enjoyed and uh, this material has helped you in microbiology, please share it as best as you can. Um, I'm going to be updating the videos for terms behind you, so definitely let anybody know that uh, these resources are available. Thanks again, and congratulations on making it all the way through the longest term of medicine, and I wish you guys the very best for your exams. Thanks.